Welcome everyone. I'm Joe Galvin, Chief Research Officer for Vistage Worldwide. I'm happy to host the latest webinar in the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion series as part of our Peak Performer webinar series. This series is designed to support your leadership climb by bringing the most trusted experts to the Vistage community. Experts that provide exceptional insight and best practices, helping you navigate new challenges and possibilities. Diversity and inclusion is important because of the evidence showing exponential return on investment. From a millennial workforce to diverse backgrounds, corporations are feeling the pressure to compete for business as well as top talent. Our Q4 2021 CEO Confidence Index shows 76% of our community are increasing headcount in the year ahead. And 72% say talent scarcity is affecting their ability to operate at full capacity. It also shows that 67% of small and mid-sized businesses indicate that the primary objective of their diversity and inclusion efforts are to attract and retain talent. That's why, I've invite, that's why we've invited Shane Foster to speak with us today on this highly relevant topic. Shane is a highly rated Vistage speaker and co-founder and CEO of Fostering Healthy Solutions, where he cultivates healthy solutions to diversity issues through education, training, and execution. He also serves as executive director of Amend Together and VP of External Affairs at YWCA of Nashville and Middle Tennessee. He's also been honored in Nashville's 2019 40 Under 40 and was a 2019 Nashville Emerging Leader Award winner. There's so much more to his story, which I'm sure he might share with you as part of his presentation. Welcome, Shane. We're anxious to learn from you today. Well, thank you so much for having me. I am excited to share with all of you what has really become my life's work. Um, just for starters, a couple of housekeeping things. Um, we're going to talk about some things today that, that you may or may not have had experience talking about in a professional setting. Um, we're going to talk about those things today, particularly as it relates to our corporate culture, what we're seeing, what our responsibility is as it relates to those things as leaders, and then that aspirational place. Where do we think our culture should be and what's our responsibilities to help us get there? Um, right now, mental health is so critical and so important. Important. So I, I, I caution everyone, please take care of yourself. Um, if something is said or you experience something that, that is triggering for you and you need to step away for a moment, please do so. It's so, so important um, to take care of self. I chose this topic, seven steps to reset corporate culture, because as we looked around the country, there's really not a need to completely start over um, and, and throw out everything in the kitchen sink. But there are some areas where we've been a little on autopilot, if you will, where we've just not been intentional about our workplace culture. Thus, there's an opportunity for us to reset. Also, we're in the midst of a perfect storm, if you will. We're still dealing with COVID-19. I thought this was going to be over in a month or two. And here we are, two years later, still talking about COVID. It's been hard. And while we've been forced to pivot in our businesses in ways that we could not have imagined, it's hit everyone differently. We're also seeing a rise in domestic violence. Of course, nobody's talking about that part. As safe at home orders have gone on around the country, around the world, everybody's not actually safe at home. And then of course, we're talking about systemic racism. We're talking about police brutality social and racial justice. And those conversations have been polarized and politicized in so many ways, and there's so much fear. It's been hard. At the exact same time, we're dealing with mental health. And we're starting to realize that as we've been in the hustle and bustle of building and growing our businesses, we've not always taken care of ourselves. And thus, Mental health has become a part of our everyday conversation. All of these things are difficult to manage on their own. And here we are in the midst of a perfect storm, handling them all together. And as we go through our time today, what I would ask you to do is to not only think about yourselves, your family, but also consider your workforce, your leadership. And while we're in the same storm, we're all in very different boats. What boat are your workforce in? 
What have they experienced in their lives that are contributing to how they show up in the workplace every single day? And also what they experience. And as leaders, what is our responsibility to make sure that as we come out of this perfect storm, that we've not just survived, but that we truly have an opportunity for every single individual to thrive. That's what this conversation is about today. As it relates to an agenda, we're gonna start off talking about is change actually necessary? And then from there, we'll talk about those intentional steps that it takes to reset our corporate culture with intentionality. And then lastly, we'll think about five years from now, where do we wanna be? What's the expectation? What's the desired outcome? And what is our responsibility to ensure that we get there? I played a little bit of basketball in my day, but I wanna really start off talking about my childhood experience. There were some things that I really wanna highlight that I think are important to our conversation today. I grew up and spent the first six years of my life living with my grandparents. I learned so much from them. They had me in church every single day. I didn't wanna be in church every day, but my grandfather was a deacon. My grandmother was a missionary. My great uncle was the pastor. So when the doors of the church were open, I was there. They thought it was important to surround me with a village of people who had an invested interest in who I would become. Taught me values, things that I hold true today. My grandfather, who served in our nation's military, he had two rules in our house. He said, you be respectful to adults and you be respectful to women. Anything else we can talk about, come to some type of agreement, but those two things are non-negotiable. And as a result, I've embodied that into my own life as well. At six years old, my life took a drastic turn as my mother came to get me and she was married to a gentleman she met as she was finishing college. And this gentleman would introduce to me what I now call the duality of people, how we can be so great in some areas of our lives and be so horrible in others. As I lived that domestic violence that I talked about before, and I found out that where you find domestic violence, you almost often always also find child abuse as I endured that as well. And while I'd love to say that I grew up watching Michael Jordan and just wanted to be like Mike, like everyone else, the truth is basketball was my escape. It was how I got away from all of the yelling, the screaming, the trauma. And I went to Vanderbilt University. I chose Vanderbilt uh, because on my visit, there were two people that I met that changed my entire outlook of Vanderbilt University. The first person was a guy by the name of David Williams. He was the athletic director at Vanderbilt University, the first African-American athletic director in the Southeastern Conference and at Vanderbilt. I'll never forget he and my grandmother talking about Kokomo, Mississippi and Blue Springs, places that are so small you couldn't find it on a map, but it's where my family calls home. The second person I met was a woman by the name of Dr. Candace Story Lee. She's the current athletic director at Vanderbilt, the first African-American female athletic director in a Power Five conference, and of course at Vanderbilt University. Seeing them there operating in such high levels of excellence. It made me feel like I too could achieve at Vanderbilt. You see, representation matters. Graduating from Vanderbilt was one of the hardest things I'd ever done. The thing that got me over the hump was my connection and relationships I had built, had built with my classmates, many of which were valedictorians and salutatorians of their high school classes. In getting to know them, I would share some things with them that they didn't experience. Like how often I would drive from one side of campus to the other, especially at nighttime and get pulled over by a police officer. And every single time the officers would say the exact same thing. I'm sorry, Mr. Foster, I didn't know it was you. Have a good day. What they didn't know is that as they walked back to their cars, I would have to sit there and gather myself for a moment, sometimes wiping a tear from my eyes as I remembered a promise I made to my mother at 13. 
You see, at 13 years old, I was walking up and down the street of New Orleans, dribbling a basketball as I often would. And the officer came and grabbed me and threw me up against a neighbor's home. And I was asking, why are you doing this? I, I didn't do anything wrong. I looked to my left and I looked to my right and I'd see my neighbors and friends and peers all standing around watching, doing absolutely nothing about it. As the officer let me go and I asked again, why, why did you do this? He said something that shook me to my core that, that I've never forgotten. He said, we got a call about some suspicious activity in this neighborhood. You fit the description. I was 13 years old. I didn't know what description he was talking about. So I go home and I ask, what, what description do I fit that would have me to have this kind of experience? And they explained to me that the description I fit is that of a black man. And thus, this probably wouldn't be my last experience. And my mom asked me to promise her. She said, promise me you'll always make the decisions that bring you back home. Sometimes keeping that promise is easier than others. I would go on to become Vanderbilt University's all-time leading scorer in school history. I was an SEC player of the year, was an All-American, inducted into two Hall of Fames. My jersey's being retired next month, which makes me sound so old. I'm really, really not. I just had a great experience. Was drafted into the NBA by the Dallas Mavericks, spent some time with the Utah Jazz, and played overseas in Italy, Belgium, and Turkey. Got a chance to travel this entire world, playing the game that I love. What I remember most about those experiences are the people. Getting a chance to be invited into people's home and spend time with fans and sponsors and CEOs of companies. I got a chance to see the diversity that our world has to offer. And what I learned is that when we take the time and, and we're intentional about celebrating those diversities, it's in that space that we see the exponential value that comes from the uniqueness of how different we all are. All of those experiences I've had allowed me to walk away with values. Values that, that dictate how I show up in the world, that dictate how I do business, but most importantly, it shapes how I treat people. I share that because it's our values that shape our corporate culture. If, you're, if we're honest about it, it's, it's our values that we use to hold ourselves to high standards. It's also what we use to hold others accountable around us. It's, it's our values that shape the expectations for behavior within the workplace. Unfortunately, as adults, quite often it's easy for us to tell our children to stand up for what's right, even if that means you gotta stand by yourself. Yet as adults, we succumb to the peer pressure, the gravitational pull towards status quo. We, we want so desperately to be accepted we're constantly thinking about what, what others might think or say if we acted in a way that was truly authentic to our values. My grandmother used to say that values aren't really values until they've been tested. So what's more important than the principles that we put on the wall or, or the values that we talk about within our culture, within our leadership teams on a regular basis, what's most important is how we show up when those values are tested. For me, leaning on my values led me to leave the game of basketball after six years of playing professionally. And when I did so and started to spend time in community, started to spend time with business leaders, I learned some things that, that stopped me in my tracks. I learned that one out of every four women experienced domestic violence in, in their lifetime. I learned that one out of every 
five women are sexually assaulted. And that one out of every seven boys have been sexually abused. That every single day in our country, three women are killed by an intimate partner, somebody who says the same thing that I said to my wife this morning, that I love you. More than 15 million children in our country witness abuse, either in their households or in their communities. And of those 15 million children, the boys are more than twice as likely to repeat that behavior. And the girls are more than twice as likely to be victims. I had to stop and ask the question, how? How is it possible that in the same spaces where all of these values exist, the golden rule, treating people how you want to be treated, values of integrity and, and character and, 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 and valuing people and perspectives and empathy, in the same spaces where we hold these values, one in five women experience sexual harassment in the workplace. And the EEOC says that when they do report it, that more than 75% of the time, they're met with retaliation. How? How is it that that is the case in the same space where we have such, such high values. And what I learned is that there's a culture that exists that allows for this to happen. A culture where we make excuses for the bad behavior of others. Where we say things like, well, you know, boys are just gonna be boys. Oh, well, they didn't mean anything by it. They were just, they were just joking. We ask questions of victims like, like, what did you do to provoke that behavior? Did you wear something that was sexually suggestive? Did you leave a drink unattended? Did you yell? Did you kick? Did you scream? Did you, did you tell someone? Did you report it? Why are you saying something after all of these years? It's, it's our culture. We, we don't even believe people when they share their stories. I'll never forget when, when Ray Rice, the running back for the Baltimore Ravens, punched his fiance in the face in an elevator. And for an entire week, all we had was her testimony saying, this is what Ray did to me. And over the course of that week, we saw leader after leader, well-meaning people say, I don't believe he would do that. The same thing that we would say about the people in our lives who we've put on a pedestal, who have impacted our lives in some way, shape, or form. Maybe they have a high title. Maybe they've been in the industry for X amount of years. Maybe they have certain experiences. We just say without even questioning it, I don't think they would do that. For an entire week, all we had was her testimony. And then we saw the video. And we were all disgusted at what we saw. But I would ask you, for those of you who have daughters, how many of you, how many of you would ask your daughter for a video if she came home and said something like that happened to her? Nobody. So why is that acceptable for anyone? It's, it's a culture and it's a culture that, that we gotta change. It's, it's no longer acceptable for, for jokes and language to be demeaning and disrespectful and devaluing of other people. And it goes back to our values, but values being put into action to where we uphold that high standard for what is acceptable and what is not, regardless 
of how well performing, regardless of title or position, regardless of economic success, regardless of proximity. We have to uphold the standard. And what Lieutenant General David Morrison says is that the standard we walk past, that is the standard we accept. The standard we walk past, the jokes, the language, the turning a blind eye, the not holding to high standards, the letting people slip and slide, the standard we walk past is the standard that we accept. I'd ask you to consider how the same conversation that we've had now concerning gender applies to race. The jokes, the language, the abuse, the stories that, that are not believed the turning of a blind eye, the lowering of standards, the experiences of people. I submit to you that we could have an hour long conversation about so many different diversities, but it all comes back to that standard to those values. For far too long, we've, we've allowed for people to treat others in ways that create a hostile working environment without, without consequence. But we have a responsibility as leaders to uphold our values regardless of how people identify. In a conversation about diversity, we have a responsibility to not exclude people, but far too often we get stuck talking about gender and race when diversity is so much broader. What about those who were born in other countries? where English is a second language. Those who have experienced disabilities and handicaps, those who have vastly different experiences than us. We have a responsibility to figure out how do we celebrate those differences and find the uniqueness that adds value to our business, to our culture. And I would submit to you that we all actually live very diverse lives. If you walk around your kitchen and then go into a bedroom, you'll see all kinds of different furniture and even pictures on the wall. Why? Because we want some difference, some variety, some diversity. When you go out to lunch or dinner, you'll, you'll typically go to different restaurants. Why? Because you want some uniqueness, some difference, some variety, some diversity. It's only when we start talking about people has diversity become hard. In the interest of recruiting diverse talent, there's all kinds of stuff that we can do, all kinds of innovative ideas that we can tap into to ensure that we're reaching diverse communities. Because representation does matter, not only from a representation standpoint, but the data suggests that the more diverse our teams are, the better they perform. But for our history, we've said that we just hire the best person for the job. We just hire the top talent. But we've not measured where we're getting our talent from. The pools where we're searching for talent and how we're going about promoting our open positions. 
this is not an exhaustive list by, by any stretch, but it's some things that we can do that get us outside of the norm so that we can access the diverse talent that exists. There's all kinds of stuff that we can do, but what it boils down to is our proximity to each other. If we're honest, we don't really do life together. I've heard people say that Sunday is the most segregated day of the week, but I would say every day is the most segregated day of the week. If we're honest, we, we spend a lot of time in our bubbles. And oftentimes our bubbles are not very diverse. But when it comes to hiring, typically, whenever there's an open position, the first place we turn to is to our networks. We send out an email with a job description and, and say, if you know somebody great, please send them our way. Well, if our networks are not diverse, then our hiring is probably not going to be diverse either. So it takes getting outside of our bubbles and getting outside of the way that we've always done things so that we can actually access the diverse talent that exists. And it's not just a feel good thing to do, it's a business thing to do. Every client I've ha I have, every single workshop that I've done working with executives across the world, everybody's looking for talent right now, everybody. So how do we get what we've, what we've never gotten? We got to do some things that we've never done. Not because it's just the right thing to do, but because it's the business thing to do. The data suggests that those executive teams that are diverse by gender and by ethnicity are outperforming their competitors when it comes to financial performance indicators. However, we've all seen across the country the companies that are putting out statements and, and putting things on social media as it relates to diversity, equity, and inclusion. However, everybody's not seeing results. And there's a reason for that. And the data suggests that in order for us to truly see the results, the return on our investment, we have to do two things extremely well. One, we have to have a systematic business-led approach to inclusion and diversity. In other words, we can't just assume that by having good standards and putting values on the wall that we're going to have an inclusive and diverse environment. It takes a strategy, a plan, intentionality. The same intentionality that we have for our business growth and strategy as a whole. We have to give that same attention to detail when it comes to diversity and inclusion with objectives, goals, most importantly, measurable deliverables. And then secondly, taking bold steps to strengthen inclusion. Having a place where your workforce, your leadership can belong. And not just be there, but bring their best self. That's what it's about. You know, when I think back to my experience with the Dallas Mavericks, I think about Dirk Nowitzki, one of the best power forwards to ever play the game of basketball. And he shared with me, he said, Shane, the difference between being good and being great is just 5%. So many think that the gap is so huge, but it's really not. The question is, are we willing to do what it takes? The seven steps to resetting corporate culture that I'm about to give you are not to make your company good. You're already good. You're a part of Vistage. But it will give you the secret sauce that will take you from where you are today to truly reaching your potential. Let's jump in. First and foremost, step one is about discovery. You can't know where you're going without first understanding where you are. And so we got to be intentional about really looking at our policies and procedures to ensure in our handbooks, to ensure that there's, there's synergy, but that what is happening every day, the actual matches the intention. 
We got to do SWOT analysis. We got to ensure that we're getting feedback from our em em employees, from our leadership. That's what inclusion looks like. Not just making assumptions based on your own experience and what you see from your level, but truly getting the perspectives of the workforce. And it's not all about what's bad and, and gaps and places where we need to grow. We also need to know what are the areas that we've knocked out of the park, both intentionally and unintentionally. It becomes a part of our story and who we are. We need that feedback both internally and externally. We gotta be comfortable having honest conversations. It's not an indictment. The purpose is not to point fingers and say, you've not done this well, or these are the areas where you need to improve, but it is about being true to ourselves, true to our values. Based on who we say we are, where are we? Where do we measure that? And how do we take where we are and ensure that we get to the place where we want to be? Step two is about training and education. Far too often, this is the first thing that's been cut from the budget. And we hire people based on their years of experience so that we can make assumptions about what they bring to the table. And the reality is, if everyone's operating from this standpoint and not providing the training, then who's providing it? And we make assumptions that because people have been in the workforce for 10 and 12 and 20 years, that they know what's acceptable and unacceptable behavior in the workplace. But the data suggests they don't. They don't always know what constitutes sexual harassment and what doesn't. They don't always know what's, what's acceptable, what's not. And if we're not setting people up for success by doing the training, then we have a huge liability on our hands. Blind spots are just that. They're blind. We don't know what we don't know. But a failure to acknowledge those flaws is what creates those costly liabilities. We got to define for our company, what is diversity, equity, and inclusion? What are we after? What does this mean here? Not the noise, not politics, not social media, but what does it mean for our community, for our stakeholders, for our workforce? And how do we make sure that we're doing everything we can to live up to our values? Step three is about creating a committee to ensure that the workload is shared. We got to make sure that, that we, we don't run out of steam, that we don't lose our momentum. And far too often, we're expecting HR professionals to do the work, to carry the load. No one position can do the work that is, is before us to do. But we have to be intentional as we formalize that committee, ensuring that there's a mission, a vision, there's, there's clear objectives so that we don't, we don't get overwhelmed and burned out. And it's also important to have term limits where this is just not the committee, they're not committed to this for the rest of their lives, but for this period of time, for one to two years, this is what we're, this is what we're going after and that we need our, the help of our workforce to really push the company forward. And we gotta empower those members, those participants through leadership support. At the end of the day, we gotta have buy-in from the top. We gotta make sure that there's an executive that is a part of that committee to ensure that the ideas and the strategies that we come up with, that we have somebody on that team who's able to speak on behalf of the executive team about what's doable, what's not, what do we have the budget for and what don't we, right? And we gotta make sure that as an executive team, we're meeting on these benchmarks and making critical decisions so that we don't lose steam, right? So that we don't fall back on what we said we were gonna do. And we gotta increase our communication. So many companies do a great job of communicating at the leadership and executive team levels and with the board, but that's not always funneling down. Thus, our workforce don't even know how they're supposed to contribute to the mission and vision. They don't know where they stand or how it's impacting them. 
and it creates that that break in communication that builds distrust for leadership. And we got to establish a budget. In other words, putting our money where our mouth is. We can tell what's important to our leadership by where we spend our resources. And far too often, many companies don't even have an HR department. Many companies have not given HR a budget to actually improve upon our people. If you have more than five employees, you're in the business of people. And they're our greatest asset and presents the greatest place for opportunity. We either hire new staff or we invest in the ones that we have. One is certainly more costly than the other. So how do we make sure that we got buy-in from the top? The next step is about building a three to five year strategy. The data suggests that it takes three to five years to truly build sustainable change. Yes, of course, there's some things that are low hanging fruit items that can be done within three to six months. But there's also some things that we got to make sure that the work that we're doing is palatable and digestible, that we'll communicate, that we'll get there in years three and four and five, so that we're not overwhelming people. We can't assume that everyone comes to this conversation with the same amount of knowledge and understanding. They don't. From an educational perspective, oftentimes we didn't question what we were being taught in school. More importantly, we didn't question what we weren't being taught. And consequently, we got executives and leaders and CEOs who are learning about things related to various communities for the first time in their lives. That has to be okay. We can't pressure people to all of a sudden, because this is so important, we're pressuring people to arrive at a stage where they've not been cultivated. That three to five years plan gives us an opportunity to communicate how we're going to move forward and gives our workforce time to truly be able to sit with and grapple with and grow over time with us. Measurable outcomes, shared ownership, benchmarks, true goals and objectives, strategic plan. And then from there as an athlete, this is the part that I get excited about and that's about execution. Ensuring that everything we said we were gonna do in that strategic plan, that is being held accountable. We measure everything. Where are we looking for talent? What does the interview process look like? How are people experiencing our company? What is the experience when they get hired? Are there opportunities for them to grow and develop? And when they do leave, why? Are they going to do bigger and better things, which, which means that they grew while they were with us, which also becomes a part of our story? Are they leaving because of what they experienced here? Workplace culture is like a pill. And we've all seen the commercials where the pills had the side effects and they put it in small print so you don't read it. What about your workplace culture? What does the small print say? What are the side effects? How are people experiencing it? Are they going home looking for other jobs? Are they excited to get up the next day and bring all that they have? We got to prioritize upward mobility. Every single position in your company needs an upward mobility plan. It doesn't mean they're going to accomplish every single thing at your company, but it doesn't mean that we're going to be intentional about a mutually beneficial relationship such that we're intentional about the growth. We got to diversify our management and leadership. When we don't have diversity represented, in the higher up positions, it communicates that diverse communities cannot grow in your company. Which means even if I'm interested, I'm only interested for a year or two. Because if, it's, if I wanna grow, I gotta go somewhere else to do it. Representation is important. And then we gotta operationalize conflict resolution. We gotta be preventative and talk about behavioral challenges that exist, issues that have come up, and what is our process for mitigating them when they happen? We're talking about people. People are going to be people. People are going to make mistakes. People are going to have conflicts. How do we handle those? You got to have a written down plan so that it takes bias completely out of the equation. 
And in the event that there is a lawsuit related to workplace culture, hostile working environment, if we don't have that plan in advance, there's no way that we beat the lawsuit. Thus, best case scenario, we settle out of court, which is still extremely costly. The very last piece is about staying in our lane. Most business owners didn't get into business because they were excited about building teams and, and helping people work well together. So it's a blind spot. And we shouldn't have to go after this alone. Hire experts to come in and help so that ultimately you don't damage the trust within your workforce, but that you have a strategy and a plan and someone there to walk with you on your journey. The ultimate goal of diversity, equity, and inclusion is about helping every single company reach their absolute potential, becoming the employer of choice, where no matter who a person is or how they identify, your company is a place where they can bring their gifts, their talents, their ideas, but they can be their best selves. Business is the place where we get to change people's lives. On average, people spend eight to 12 hours a day working. I, for one, would prefer to be with my family. But if I'm going to spend eight to 12 hours at work, how we make that experience matters. And there's negative health outcomes directly related to stress from work. So by improving the workplace culture, we're literally changing people's quality of life. When you hear about the return on investment, we're looking for these things. This is how we measure diversity, equity, and inclusion. We're looking for an increase in productivity, the ability to retain the top talent that we're hiring, free-flowing ideas and solutions, innovation, the ability to save money because we're mitigating those lawsuits before they ever happen. And we're increasing engagement, both internally and externally. I'd love for you to spend some time really evaluating your company. How are we doing when it comes to diversity, equity, inclusion, and empathy? Where are we? And also ask our leadership. Oftentimes, if you're the CEO and then you, you do this with your teams, you'll find out there's, there's some differences in terms of the way that you see the company and the way that others do. How do we measure that? How do we get a baseline and understand the areas where we can celebrate and highlight, as well as the areas where we have some work to do. Five years from now, what will it take? What will it take to ensure that every single person in your company is operating at their peak performance levels? What would be the impact to your company if every single employee, every single leadership member is operating at their peak performance levels? Some say it's, it's otherworldly. It would change everything. If that's the case for you, what are we willing to do to ensure that we get there? We live in a world that's too contradictory, where the way that we show up every single day is different than what we tell our kids. And we often succumb to that peer pressure a gravitational pull towards status quo. We have a responsibility as leaders to be authentically ourselves and truly live out those values. As leaders, we should be asking ourselves these three questions every single day. What kind of leader do I want to be? How do I get 1% closer to that every single day? And once I figure some things out, how do I take what I've learned and share it with others? I've heard all kinds of regrets from folks all over the world as it relates to diversity being in the pipeline and not having access to diverse communities, not having the budget to invest in professional development, not really reacting to the complaints, things that are coming forward, and being completely disconnected from our workforce, not to the extent that we don't even know how people are experiencing our company. Every single regret comes with an action item things that we can do to be intentional, to make sure that we 
get the desired result. The difference between good and great is just 5%. The question is, are we willing to do it? I'll leave you with this quick story. I had a 13-year-old boy call into ESPN the day that I did my very last interview as an athlete. And this 13-year-old boy said, Shane, I don't, I don't have a, a question, but I just wanted to say thank you. He said, thank you for being my role model. He said he didn't have a father in his life growing up, but his mom brought him to those basketball games. And so he, he watched me. He said he chose his number because of me. He would point up every time he made a basket because he saw me do it. He said he got an award for character in his school because he was trying to be the very best person that he could be every day. He said, thank you. I share that with you because I never got to meet the kid. But in that moment, that young man taught me that every single one of us is impacting somebody else. And most of the time, they're not going to come pat us on the back. They're not going to tell us that they're watching, but they're watching your every move. So the question I, I leave you with is what do people experience when they experience you? Because they see who we hire and who we don't. They see who we promote we don't. They see the jokes and the language that we hold accountable in the spaces where we turn a blind eye. But every single one of us is recreating ourselves in the world by way of somebody else saying, I want to be just like them when I grow up. What do they experience when they experience you? We have a responsibility to ensure that DEI is not just about people of color, gender, but it's about everybody, how everybody experiences our company, our culture, and our responsibility to make sure that every single person reaches their peak performance levels. Seven steps. It's not overwhelming, but it's just 5%. Are we willing to do it? I'm Shane Foster. Thank you all so much for having me. Shane, thank you so much. Uh, you have certainly given uh, me and, and everyone a lot to think about. Uh, your story is inspiring. The message that you send is one that is, is obviously you know, very important to people today. We've seen in our community uh, from Q4 of 2019 to Q4 of 2021, a really significant change in terms of uh, the, all the aspects of diversity, equity, and inclusion that you mentioned. Uh, but having said that, our community is fairly representative of, of America, and we've got some folks who it is not yet important to them. So for people who are maybe saying, you know what, I need to get started on this. I know you've covered this, but for people that are saying, you know what, it's time, what's one of the first things they should do? Well, I think first and foremost, um, it's important to hire somebody to help. You, you, you just don't know what you don't know. We've not, we've not been doing diversity, equity, and inclusion our whole lives. We've not. That, that's, that's not been how we've run our businesses. And so we, we got to get somebody who this is what they do. This is their sweet spot. This is their passion. But also they bring the research and the data to the table that gives us an opportunity to have a data-driven approach. And so we got to hire somebody to come in and help. Um, and then from there, it's really about that baseline data, really understanding where we are. We can't just start off talking about these issues, not understanding where our workforce is. Some of these topics are, are, are more sensitive than others. And, and, and when we go about it in ways um, that are not palatable, that are not digestible, we end up doing more harm than good. So I would say start there. Start with hiring somebody to come in and help and then be intentional about making sure that we get that data on the front end to inform how we move forward. You know, let's take a step forward because uh, many organizations have it as a, uh, maybe not a priority, but it's part of what they do. Uh, maybe they put energy into it. Recently, you know, it's been a very challenging environment with all that's going on. Maybe it's, it hasn't had the, the priority or the attention it should have had. How does someone who started kickstart and re-energize um, and take this to the next level, uh, knowing they still got a long way to go? 
Well, that brings about the, the, the strategic plan, right? When we have a three to five year strategic plan, that informs how we're moving, the pace by which we're moving, what we're covering, and it gives us a tool to be able to communicate when people have questions, what we're doing, where our intentions lie, what's our mission, what's our vision, what, why are we doing this in the first place? All of those questions get answered in that strategic plan. And as I stated, there are some things that we can do immediately. We can, we can get the baseline data. We can understand where we are in terms of our metrics, who's in our company, who's not, who's missing, who's been excluded thus far. Where have we been looking for talent? Where have we not tapped in to the resources and, and the communities that exist within our city, our state, um, our industry, right? We can do those things now. We can, we can ensure that we're working on this strategic plan and put some partnerships in place to where this becomes really organic. Those are some things that we can do now. As it relates to training and information, that's critical. We can do that simultaneously, but we can't overwhelm people. Right. And so we got to make sure that the topics, as well as the speed by which we're offering the education, is palatable and digestible. So that strategic plan allows us to do that and arrive ultimately at the place that we want to be in a faster pace. Right. And, and so that's what it's about. You got to have a strategic plan to inform your direction. So let's go to the next level then. For those organizations to whom this is a priority, who have been not just talking, but actually walking the walk, how do you keep it fresh? How do you keep it front of mind? How do you keep all the other challenges and issues that our leaders are facing on a daily basis? How do you keep this at least someplace on the desk of importance? Well, it's two things. One, that having that diversity, equity, and inclusion committee is critical in that regard. And having an executive be a part of that committee right? And, 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 and ensuring that you're meeting regularly, you're meeting those benchmarks, you're measuring success, and you're pivoting when, when necessary, because that's going to happen. And that, that strategic plan has to be a living and a breathing document. But from there, we got to assess, we got we to gotta make sure that there's a budget attached to this. Where we spend our resources, we pay attention, right? And we hold accountable. And we're, we're constantly looking at what the return on investment is when we've put our money where our mouth is. Oftentimes, when we don't put a budget to it, it's easy to miss a meeting, to reschedule, to put something on the back burner. Listen, we're in business, right? We have all kinds of competing priorities. Those are not going to stop because we engage in diversity, equity, and inclusion. So we have to be intentional on the front end and ensure that we reset our corporate culture in such a way that this becomes a priority. And then it also becomes a part of how we evaluate our talent, right? So our managers, uh, um, our hiring managers, our HR professionals, our board, we have metrics that are related to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and that becomes a part of how we do business. If it's not a part of organically how we do our work, it's easy to put it in a bucket and then push it to the side. And then our workforce is the one that's damaged the most because they're the ones who are gonna say, wait, what happened to what we said we were gonna do? Where's our progress? Where are we in this? I knew that this was just a fad and it was going to be something that, that we weren't going to follow through on. That damages trust, it damages the, the, the workforce, and it damages our culture. Yeah. You know, you've spoken a lot about the importance of having this embedded into your culture, yet all CEOs are struggling with adapting their culture to this now remote workforce. People that they work fully remote or work hybrid, or and a question that came from our community, from our audience here today, you know, they've got an environment where people are on Mondays and Fridays, but they're out on customer sites or on location or doing something in that that brave new world. Uh, help us understand things that we can be doing there to keep this keep this front of mind. Well, first and foremost, we got to engage the workforce. Right. We, we, got, we got to sit down with them at the table and say, what's doable? What's palatable for you? These are some of the things that we're thinking about that we want to get done over the next three months, over the next year, the next two years. We want you to be a part of that. What ideas do you have? Right. How does the, how can we make sure that this fits within your realm of responsibilities? Right. So, number one, that's what inclusion looks like. It's not about us sitting at the table um, just as leadership and saying, what do we want people to do? No, we got to include them in the process. That way they're bought in. 
This is not something that that that, that just one or two or, or a few individuals are working on. This is what we're doing collectively. It's collective ownership. This is going to become who we are and how we move forward. And we got to do that on the front end as opposed to the back end, making sure that inclusion is a huge part of what we're doing. And then from there, it's really about evaluating, you know, where are we in the process? Have we done training? Have we done surveys? Do we know what people are thinking and how they're experiencing our workforce and the areas that we can improve? You know, when, and, and then, you know, we've gotten, I don't want to say lazy, but we've gotten comfortable with being disconnected from people. Yeah. This virtual space has forced us to be more intentional about making those connections and spending time with people because we're not passing each other in the break room. We're not, we're not walking into the building together in the morning or leaving after work. We're not doing the happy hours like we did before. So those organic times are no longer there. That's where we have to hold our managers to a higher standard of ensuring that we're connected with our people, right? And so whether they're working out in the field or they're in the office, we still have to be intentional about making those connections so that we never lose touch of what is happening, how people are interacting, what people need as it relates to their own professional development and growth. Well, you know, you just spoke about an important point about managers and the, and the, the new environment of this remote employee that managers have to deal with. Can you give us some insights on how to really work with managers or develop those managers to bring that culture to life? Well, a part of it is, is really reevaluating some of those roles and responsibilities. And we got to be honest, for, for, for really the history of business, we've built in these skeleton job descriptions for managers such that they have so many responsibilities that are directly tied to our bottom line that they don't have time to go and actually spend real-time effort and energy mentoring, building, and growing our workforce. So they are overwhelmed. So we got to go back to the drawing board and look at those job responsibilities and ensure that diversity, equity, and inclusion is a part of that. Growing their staff, spending the time developing their workforce is a part of their responsibilities. And then when we do performance reviews, that has to be front and center, right? Well, Shane, That's so critical and important. Shane, thank you so much for your insights. I, I can't imagine how full my brain would be if I listened to you for a whole for a whole uh, a group meeting session, but I plan to catch you later on this year when you come to my part of the world. But thank you very much for your time, for your energy, for your thoughts, and really this powerful message you share with our community. Thank and you. for our Vistage members, uh, you can look forward to uh, an economic update from Dr. Alan Bolio, ITR Economics on February 18th. I spoke to Alan earlier this week. Uh, there's a whole lot of insights as we go now deeper into this year and how that's important. And also everyone mark your calendar for the webinar, Hire Better, uh, where uh, they will come in and share their insights on how Rethink Hiring incorporating much of what we've learned from Shay today in the new talent wars in a, in a webinar on February 25th. Now you can find more information and register for these webinars at vistage.com slash webinar. That's vistage.com slash webinar. Again, thank you, Shane, for your time, for your thoughts. Uh, and thank you, everyone, uh, for being part of today's event. Uh, stay well, stay safe. Thank you for your time.